Hello, and welcome to League of Josh podcast. My name is Joshua, and I am your host. Today, I have with me Harry Coles. For those of you who have been following from the beginning, Harry was my first guest. Also, hi, Mom. Thanks for the support. After months of begging, Harry finally agreed to come back onto the show, and I was fortunate enough to have a really good discussion with him about habit forming and resiliency and also family. So all of those are very important to me, and I've done a decent amount of research into them lately, and I hope that you guys enjoy the, the perspective of Harry. I think that we're very different in many ways and very similar in many ways, so having his perspective on things is always very important to me. And yeah, I'm really glad that he was able to come on. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Thanks a lot. To address some groundkeeping very quickly, I'm going to start uploading a podcast every single Wednesday, so you can keep your eye out for that. Also, I would love feedback from you guys, so if you have any questions about things or any topics that you would like covered or potentially people you would like me to ask onto the show, please leave a comment or even message me directly. Um, if you enjoy the show, and a good way to support it would be to recommend it to friends. Uh, you could recommend it to friends as a before bed routine, and if you have enemies, you can recommend it as a driving podcast. So. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Uh, enjoy. Bye. But we're doing there it. We're, this is us right now. We're talking and being recorded simultaneously. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, so let's dive right, right back into what we were just talking about. <laughs> and, uh, isolation through COVID. And as you a uh, continuing student, I'm just doing my last class as well. But it's a little bit different for me, I think. Oh, really? Open learning ones or? Yeah, just one from last summer that I consistently put off. There you go. Yeah. yeah so, um, that's, that checks out. I've done that. Yeah. yeah I, I, uh, I, I just don't enjoy the – I don't even know how to explain it. It's, it's an interesting class. It's uh, human resiliency. Avery did it in a couple of weeks, and I've, I've taken it. Also that. checks out. Yeah. 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 And so I've, I've had to do it in a lot of months. but. It's, it's interesting as a topic, but as a, as a, as a quantitative study, it's difficult to get into because it's so, it's so homogeneous in the way that it works because for some people, this thing works and for some people, this thing works in terms of resiliency. And yeah. it's cool to understand how quickly people can bounce back from adversity in their lives. But one thing that I've found difficult with this is that different things just work for different people. So it's, it's tough to say, well, this is one thing that works here and this is one thing that works here, but you kind of have to, you really have to pick your lot with it. Do and you think people learn resilience over time or it's just born, they've got it? Tough. Uh, I think that, I think that strikes a chord with the free will argument. I think that people do have the opportunity to learn about it. You can pick up a book, you can go and read studies and understand, and then you can start to incorporate those studies and practice into your life. But whether you ever had it. So there are actually a few things that are more consistent in terms of individual resiliency. So individual, individual resiliency is associated quite highly with IQ. That's a, a better predictor okay. of resiliency. I think it has something to do with maybe divergent thinking, also just potential. IQ is one of the highest determinants for success right above conscientiousness. So your ability to work hard is conscientiousness or your ability to continue doing a task. And um, so I think IQ is kind of a, a two pronged sword or spear in that sense where you, you have a maybe higher capacity for divergent thinking and you also have far more potential than someone who doesn't have a high IQ. And there are also things that are, that play into it. Like um, what is it like a AQ emotional intelligence? Oh Yeah. Stuff yeah. like that. That's that's a, a lot tougher to quantify. There are things that kind of get in the way of that. Like managerial staff with higher emotional intelligence tend to do a little bit worse because they're more agreeable. Um, but it's a it's a very it's re, it's a really slippery place. You know, it's really it's really muddy right now because we don't have a or the research that has been done. Something I found really interesting actually was that at risk indigenous youth fare far better when they're able to or when they're encouraged to practice culture, family, and language. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that was something that I, I really liked from, I just wrote a paper on indigenous resiliency 
for Canadian at-risk youth. And that was one of the main findings that I found to be quite consistent was that people who were more, pe people who practice their, just their general culture, their understanding of land, of language, of their, their past and people who, and then, then that all kind of ties them together, right? Because if you, if you study your culture, then you have to study that within a community and within a community you find family and you have family and that family becomes closer together when you have cultural practices. So I thought that those were all more or less intertwined together, but I thought that that was a, a really interesting part of my, my research. Yeah, I was having this, this conversation with someone about like um, role models and inspirations and like when you're a kid, you always look up to like, say for probably me and you as athletes and mm -hmm. lots of people look up to celebrities, but as you get older, you kind of narrow down and you find ones that are more close to home. Mm -hmm. you know like you said we're talking about and i've been going through it the last last few months um and uh, it was funny my my outlook kind of always changes about that but i look at someone like my mom and i mean this is this is very very open but we had a discussion a few days ago because my my father left when i was young and i we we don't really speak about it and i said i was like how did you manage you know you've got two kids that were seven and four and she was like harry i just got on with it that was it i just i didn't sit there and sorry for myself and just got on and that's something i'd like to think i do but she was like i just got on with it that was it i didn't think about it she said life that's it All right there we go you know so some people have to think really deep about it but my mum was just like right yep there we go that's it that's happened now let's deal with it and i always remember i mean you know with injury when i did my knee scott clark i he was probably the first person i saw i got the hospital and he was like what'd they say i was oh they said an acl he went out, well they're the cards you've been dealt that's what you've uh oh sorry that's what you've got to do and i was like is that simple he was like yep so this is, you can't change what's happened now. That's it. You know, and like, you know, with your Achilles, it's like, you can sit there and feel sorry for yourself, but it's not going to do anything, is it? Mm -hmm. you know? I, uh, and, I think with my first Achilles, I was much more, I'm not even sure if it was accepting. I think I was accepting my, my second Achilles too, but my first Achilles, I was, I was just on a mission from the get go. I read a book called the way of the peaceful warrior by Dan something I forget his I forget his last name but he I want to say he was at Stanford and he got in a motorcycle accident and shattered his entire leg so he, he just blew up his whole leg and he was a, a gymnast and he goes through this really cool spiritual awakening where he's meditating for however many hours a day and he starts running on his leg before he's supposed to and he does all this stuff and all of it's part of this big spiritual journey and then he ends up winning the NCAA championship the year after. And so I read that and was just hyper motivated. And, yeah. and like, you know, you, you knew me when I was, when I was going through that and I was doing like three or four kilometer hikes up mountains and yeah, I, I was doing battle bluff. And, and then the second time I, I literally couldn't move without crying for about a week and a half to two weeks because I just, it felt like I had climbed this giant mountain and then I got to the top of it for a few minutes and then looked up again and there was another mountain that I had had to climb. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, a t it's a tough one, isn't it? Because I definitely did that when you do it and then you almost get in that, that mamba mentality thing where you're like, right, I'm going to do it in half the time. I'm going to recover like no one else did. And then you just like, you hyper motivated. It's such a good one, isn't it? And then... Mm -hmm. Oh, you dive in, you just dive into the, I think it's, I think it's about diving into the suffering in some sense. You're like, this is going to suck, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to jump into this. And I'm like you said, I'm going to do this better than anyone's ever done it. And I'm going to figure out all the shortcuts. And, and I think, I think that worked to my betterment and also to my disadvantage in some areas, because as I got to the points that I was supposed to be, when you, when you first start off, you think, well, other people are jumping at, six months, I'm going to be jumping in five months. And then once you hit those markers, you realize there is a, 
an actual biological, there are biological mechanisms in place that don't allow you to do that. And those, that's why those restrictions are put in. That, that's the worst thing. And, and I, and not even injury wise, but even challenges in life, you can never compare to anyone else. Mm -hmm. Everyone's built different, aren't they? And I remember the, the, the physio said that to me, I was like, you know, at three, and when it, he said, when it happens, it happens, you know, when you start running, when you start doing this, that's when it happens. And I took, I took 12 months to recover from mine. And I know lots of people do it in seven and eight. And I was quite lucky because obviously the season got canceled, didn't it? Because mm -hmm. I was on that mission. I was like, right, I've, I think I had like 270 something days from when I had the surgery to the start of training camp. And I was like, right, that's it. I mapped it all out. And looking back, I'd have probably, I'd have probably torn it again or done more damage if I, I jumped in when I did. I was having this discussion with my mum the other week. And I had a full year. And it, my body feels great now. I probably feel the mm -hmm. strongest I've ever felt, you know, and that, that pressure. Um, yeah, and I always remember speaking to Casey because he tore his Achilles. Yeah. And he was like, I'm going to do it in six months. And he, he did, didn't he? You know, mm -hmm. some people just, just like that. They're freaks of nature, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> and they can just recover like that. But I definitely, because I, I remember when you did your Achilles. Mm -hmm. And when I did my knee, it was the first big injury. And you, you find so much out about yourself. And I know people, it's, it's quite common for people to have injuries like that. And I found out so much about myself when I did my knee, mm -hmm. you know. And it was nice to have a break. You know, I played soccer for, since I was three until, up until then, you know, all year round. That was the first time I've ever had time off. And, you did stuff you probably didn't do before. You know, you find other stuff that makes you happy. So ah, I love soccer and that much makes me happy, but you know, you find other stuff to do and yeah. Well, that was something that I think I had addressed it the year prior, which thank goodness or else I'm not sure if I would have been able to pull up from the spiral that was that, but a, there was a kind of sports psychologist. I'm actually trying to get him on, but he's always um, in deep work. So he says, uh, and I think he means spiritual, but I, I'm pretty yeah. sure his name, his name was Vince and he came in the year before with an ex Olympian named Martin reader. And they just kind of took us through a training camp. And one of the big points that Vince made was that you have to learn how to define yourself. So yeah. a lot of people in athletics and in work, it's one of the first things we ask each other, what do you do for work? Uh, what are you studying? What are you? Yeah. And it's, it's how we come to define ourselves, particularly as athletes. Like, what do you do? I, oh, I play volleyball. Oh, I play soccer. Oh, I play basketball. And that's the way that we define ourselves. And that's the, we, we build ourselves up around that cornerstone. And once that cornerstone disappears or collapses for whichever reason, then, then we end up just losing our entire sense of self. And so I was fortunate enough to have gone through that the year before and not, not necessarily gone through that as in I had actually lost that pillar to some extent I had, I think spiritually, but not physically. And so I, I kind of came to terms with my necessity to build a personality outside of volleyball and athletics. So I worked a lot harder towards yeah. that. And I think that actually improved my athletic performance quite a bit was having things outside of athletics. Yeah. That's an interesting point you said that you know, when, especially with student athletes, when you meet someone, like, I try to avoid it by say, you know, the first thing, but it isn't. And we're coming to that stage now where you're finishing. It's like, right, you've got to find this. And I read a lot of, uh, we're not like that, but a lot of pro athletes when they retire, it's like, right, you know, what, what do I do now? You, you've done something for 20 years and you've got to find a new, new lease of life almost. Um, and definitely pre preparing and it, it sounds bad, but that injury probably prepared me for that because you had time to sit down and be like, right, you know, what, what else do I enjoy doing? You know, you find different things that you do. Um, I swim loads now. I love yeah. swimming. Yeah, yeah. My, my mom's a swimming teacher and my sister swam comparatively. And I, I dabbled in it, but I never really did. But I love swimming now. And I always remember speaking to someone and they said, they swam. And I said, what do you love about it most? And they were like, when I jump, when I jump into the pool for the first time and just like submerse myself and it's just complete silence. And I do that every time. 
the lifeguards probably get worried when they see me because I just jump in the pool and I stay under for like 30 seconds mm -hmm. and just complete, complete silence. And I read like the salt baths people do mm -hmm. where you can, I've always, I want to try that now. Floating. Just, yeah, the float, because you can do the, the floating tank, can't you? Yeah. Have you done that? Yeah, I've done it a few times. Yeah. That's sensory deprivation. They're, they're cool. It's really similar to, I find it really similar to meditation. It's kind of a different way to get into a meditative state. If you think of meditation, not as a, an act in itself, but a state of mind. I think that yeah. a float is a good way to get into that, especially if they have, I, I've gone to float tanks that have diurnal beats and stuff where you're, you're sitting there and you're listening to pure tones and it's completely dark and they're very cool. I would highly recommend it. Yeah. I, uh, I've been swimming a lot more recently. I was an atrocious swimmer, as in I would just splash around a lot. And so I've been, oh, trying, really? to, I've been trying to actually be more uh, mindful and dynamic in the pool. And so when I do a front stroke, I'm turning my thumb upside down so that I can actually get into the pool without making a splash. But I have a really deep connection with water, especially with my Achilles, because that was the only place where I could like that was the place where I learned how to walk again yeah. and any exercise that I would do. That's why I came down here was because my mom had a pool and I couldn't get into a pool in Canada without yeah. going through a, a, a line, some kind of weight and yeah. having to go to the pool at six in the morning while living an hour out of town and having to get someone to drive me. So that's why I came down here. And even the last time I would spend, I would spend four hours a day just walking back and forth in a pool, just practicing the movement, practicing the movement. And so I've, I really love water. It's just such a, I found that anything, anything you can do in water, you can do out of water. It just requires a lot more strength. And so I find that somewhat freeing. I mean, not if you're, if you're basing yourself on the ground, I don't mean you can swim on land, but if you're basing yourself on the ground of the pool, doing handstands, doing, any for me it's just doing a calf raise uh yeah but i i've always found water to be very freeing yeah i i'm not a big running fan i'm not i'm really not into running mm -hmm. uh obviously i i do to maintain fitness but i just find i can't i think so i've run so much I, I can't switch off when i run but when i swim i do and whether it's because there's more variables to it you know the the techniques more you're having to concentrate more on, on what you're doing like running you just get in a flow and it's like mm -hmm. you know but swimming i find i completely switch off when i swim and that's probably it because you're concentrating on so much and i try to break it down like every little technique and every bit to it i i just think about that yeah swimming's great and it's just yeah i recommend swimming to anyone it's, i love swimming my shoulders have gotten a lot better as well my shoulders get really messed up i they've gotten really messed up after each Achilles because you're just on crutches for so long and you're in that yeah. position. And so that's been something I've been trying to work on is loosening up my, my upper pecs underneath my collarbone. This area gets super tight. And so my shoulders are really high. So I've been working hard to reintroduce my shoulders to different strengths and different areas. And so swimming is a huge one for that. It's so low maintenance. I think everyone should at least jump into a pool once or twice a week if they have access to it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting because like my mum's my a, a swimming teacher and when I was a kid growing up, before every kid left elementary school, they should, have, should be able to swim 25 metres. That was something the, the, the government put in place. So, like, and my mum made sure every kid could swim. It's, it's a basic life skill, isn't it? Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's amazing some people. And obviously there's, they just didn't have access to it. You know, and, and um, yeah, I mean, like, like you said, the, the TCC now, it's so booked up. You just don't have access to it, do you? You know, yeah. and like you said, you've got what, a pool in Arizona, so you can, you can use that. But, yeah, how's the Achilles feeling? It's sore when I get up, and then after a few minutes of walking, it's fine. Uh, I went for my first jog about a week ago, maybe a little bit longer than that. but. Kind of, has your plan changed since from the first one? Pardon? After, has it changed when you did the first one? Have you mapped out the whole plan? Are you just kind of going with it now? About yeah, I'm, I'm doing. I'm doing without heals. a physio. Yeah, when your so, body heals, it heals. Yeah, um, my goal 
is to do it without a physio and map my progress. And I made a TikTok account so that I can put up videos of learning how to walk. I think because my primary motivation was actually while being in India, you see people that are physically decrepit because they injure themselves at a young age and there's not enough information or there's no health care. So you have these people in lower caste systems with that are super hunched over or they're walking on yeah. the side of their foot and that causes problems all the way up their their sides. So my goal was just to make something that it's going to be completely phrased as all personal stuff, just things that I do and I did rather than advice because I don't want to be liable for anyone re <laughs> or messing up their, yeah. their Achilles. But it's, it's something that happens all over the world. And I think that not everyone really understands it. So I'm going to try to put as much peer reviewed research into it and basically just go off of personal experience. And like I said, I'm trying to do it without a physio so that I can walk the walk and say, I did all of this without a physio. And so you have the capability to do it without a physio as well. But that's also something that's really tough to put up because I want it to be very, very good. And so I'm a little bit hesitant to do it. So I might put a little bit together each day or write a little bit each day. And then I've made the first video, but now I'm just waiting to post that. And then I'll start posting more videos after because I'll be forced to. But yeah. yeah. So what else do you work? What other papers are you working on right now? Oh, yeah. Uh, besides the resiliency stuff, I just read a lot. I've been reading oh, really? two or three books a week normally. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I read for about, so I, I wake up at about six and I read until about nine. And then I feed my dogs and then I go outside and spend a little bit of time in the garden and meditate a little bit. And then I'll come back in, work out. And then mornings are just the most productive time. Morning? Oh, yeah. I, when you get up and you, you, you know, you've got it planned out. And they're the most, I could get up at seven and study until nine, no distractions, not get mm -hmm. more work doing, done than if I studied from 12 till eight. Yeah. You know, it's just such a, it's a rewarding time getting up that early, I find. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost that kind of, right, no one else is up. And there's no distractions now. And especially in the summer, like, you know, in Camel, it's probably the same in, in Arizona. It's, the morning is just beautiful here. And it's just the best time to get up. Yeah. Um, yeah. The most productive time mornings are. Well, I sleep. I, I just don't close my blinds. I have to kind of close one of my blinds because there's a... So Arizona has, in lots of the communities, they don't have street lamps. Oh, so really? They'll, they'll have very few street lamps. Yeah, it's a really big... I think it's for the astrology, not astronomy. Astronomy is the horoscope stuff. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Uh, or maybe it's not. Ah, maybe I'm messing it up. Uh, people like to look at stars here. And so they have, they actually <laughs> That's have. That's the way I put it. People like yeah, stars. Yeah. In, yeah. In not the horoscope uh, stuff. But so the stars are super visible all the time. But the only street lamp on our street happens to be right outside of my window. Mm. And so I have to close my blind a little bit. But I try to sleep with my blinds open so I can wake up with the sun or have the sun wake me up. Because I, I think that's natural. I try not to get up before the sun's up. Mm. However, we started off saying about me in isolation. How have you found it not seeing many people? Or uh, I, I dive into myself. I think a lot more than most people do. I am, I'd say I'm, I'm really between introvert and extrovert. I'm a bit more of an ambivert, but I'm, I think that when I'm alone and by myself, I'm super introverted. I don't really crave the, the attention and the other people a lot. I'll, I'll only have a few conversations each week. I'll call Randy for a few hours. I'll call Ty for a few hours or, yeah those are normally the, the two guys that I talk to the most often Then every now and then I'll, I'll squeeze another person to there. And, but for the most part, I, I like to be alone. I like to, like I said, I, I probably end up reading for six hours a day, maybe, maybe a little bit, maybe a little less, maybe a little bit more, but yeah, I read for three hours in the morning and then do all my stuff, work on my papers. I hang out with my dogs a lot. I've been trying more and more to stay off of my phone. 
It's that's the big one. It's, yeah. It, it's just a time sink. And that's kind of how I've started to frame it to myself is that. So something, an idea that I've kind of been working on, it's kind of influenced by exterior people, but this, uh, this idea of like positive feedback loops in the dopamine system. So candy, sugars, your phone, things that give you an instant hit of gratification rather than things that give you a delayed hit of gratification. Okay. So I've been trying to work more on that. So similar with working out where it, it took me quite a while to get back into working out while I was down here because I really like to do more dynamic functional exercises and it's tough to do that when you yeah number one can't walk and number <laughs> two have like a lot of tightness in your leg and so i was worried about re-injuring something so my workouts i it, it got to a point where i just set up a little area basically a yoga mat maybe a little bit bigger than that but i have a little pull-up bar and i would just go and spend five minutes in there and not even work out i would hang for a couple minutes and then i would leave and that would be my workout for the day. Or I would go in there, do a couple of push-ups and then leave. And then the next day I'd go back in and do the same thing and do the same thing. And just, that was my way of working it back in. Uh, Terry Crews, actually, I, that's where I got it from. He talks about how, or he talked about in some interview somewhere, uh, how he would go to the gym with a magazine. When he was first getting back into the gym, he would just go to the gym and read a magazine for two hours. And then he would leave. And then you would come back the next day and read a magazine. And so it was for him, it was just about blocking a, an amount of time. And then from there, he could manipulate what he did in that time. Yeah. It was about blocking the time first. And so for me, I've been just walking into the gym. Like it's literally just a square in my garage. And walk into the gym, do a couple of push-ups, do a band exercise, leave. And yeah, you come back the next find day. that. I've been guilty of that people try to dump, jump in the deep end straight away. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think... It's a big thing with running. Everyone has this mind about 5K and 10K. I don't know whether it's like this human mind that kind of, it has to hit that number. People are like, I'm going to run a 5K. And, you know, you're just like, why don't you go run a 1K? Mm -hmm. Or go, go finish a 1K. Go run it. And if you walk it, you walk, you know. Yeah. It's just that kind of, like you said, getting there and, and doing it. Or if you're swimming, go swim a length, you know, and go spend that time in the pool mm -hmm. and go sit there. And then you block that time out to go, to go do it. Um, but, but even I'm guilty of that as well. Oh, you I know, think everyone is. The getting up early one as well, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, I mean, there are, there are tricks too. That's kind of what I've been trying to figure out is what, how do you, how do you decrease the failure rate? Yeah. You, and, and definitely what you said about delayed gratification, like I think I do stuff and you want an instant reward for it. Mm -hmm. you know, in your mind, like that dopamine hit or whatever. But sometimes you'll, you'll find it later in the day. Like you say, if you got up early and you've done everything you needed to do, those jobs you didn't want to do, and later in the day, you're going to feel so much better for it and you've got time to do stuff instead of being like, right, I'll wait and I'll wait and I'll wait. Um, yeah, and you, you just need to find stuff that has that delayed graphic. That's a good one, actually. I like that, mm -hmm. Josh. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Write it down. Uh, I, uh... Even, even with other stuff. So the way that I'm conceptualizing with my phone is that I'm essentially, I'm giving the same amount of attention to my phone as I'm giving to any other thing that I read or sit there and browse through monotonously. And I'm not getting a lot from my phone if I scroll Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, whatever. And actually, I have seen people curate their TikTok accounts to be really productive, which I think is cool. I think that's that's the area that I'm somewhat striving towards is having it to be a productive scroll rather than a mindless scroll. But more on the macro scale of that is that if I read, even if you read a book a month, that feels a lot better. I, I think I've found that, that reading, like if you read a book, then you actually, you have information. You've actually pulled something out of this. Whereas your phone is that it's more pulling something out of you. In, yeah. In, I try time and resource. I rarely listen to music now. I just try to listen to podcasts. Mm -hmm. Like if you're eating or you're walking about, you know, because I'll listen to the same song a hundred times, mm -hmm. but you're not really gaining anything from it. But if you're listening to a podcast, you're trying to learn something. And sometimes I just put it on shuffle on podcast. I'll listen to anything. 
mm-hmm. you know, and you, you, you try to learn some. I've listened to some of the craziest podcasts. <laughs> um, and yeah, being, being productive, you know, I think I've found that over the four years is finding windows to be productive. Like you could be productive for 30 minutes or like HR is a great example here. You know, people might not know what that is, is at TRU, but House of Learning mm-hmm. is I've spent House of Learning. I've spent, you know, six, seven hours at House of Learning and probably got an hour's work done. You mm-hmm. know, there's so much going on. There's people there. You know everyone. Whereas if I was to go sit in a library for 45 minutes, I'd probably get that work done or you shut your phone off for that time. Um, yeah, just being productive, you know, finding them, them productivity windows. Yeah. Uh, it's so key, whether you're a morning person, evening, afternoon, you know, it's just through trial and error doing it, you know. There's a, so there are these things called ultradian rhythms. And it's the more or less the rhythm, the rhythms that we go through in a 90 minute bout. So you have your circadian rhythm, which is about a day. And then within that, there are these 90 minute bouts. And I've tried to restrict my learning bouts to 90 minutes. So reading is something that I, I actually, I have to, when I hit about that 90 minute period, I, I realized that my focus is leaving. So if I want to read for another hour and a half or however long, I normally have to practice some kind of almost a, a tumo breathing technique where I'll breathe in really, really fast so that I can kind of stimulate that, that sympathetic nervous system again, so that I can refocus my, my intent back onto my book. So that's something that I've been working on lately, but even just like, if I start a learning bout, I'll try to finish it doing that thing. I won't sit down and read for five minutes and that, cause that's when you get into it. I think that's something that also people have issues with is that the first 10 minutes of of a learning bout is super frustrating. Yeah, you you you're thinking of, and that's me with reading as well. Mm-hmm. Like almost the first couple pages, I'm not taking in the information. I'm still thinking of surroundings around me, whether it's noises or the sun, and just kind of zoning, zoning out. And and I'm finding ways now how to do that that isn't playing sport because in sport you just zone out, you know. Mm-hmm you just and that's because we're, we're trained to do it and that's almost a, a form of meditation for many people and definitely for me you find that and now you've got to try find ways that in other ways you do that and that's something i'm i'm still working on i was listening to something the other day i don't know whether it was it's, um it's true or not but it was about how many good decisions you can make in a day there's kind of Oh, men, uh, uh, only so many you can make. And I think there was something about Barack Obama, how he only had so many suits in his wardrobe because they believe that him deciding what to wear that day, it's not like that minimalist thing, isn't it? That you're cutting stuff out because you're deciding. And I, I found that when I try to be productive, I, the night before I'll be like, oh, if I'm going to go to the gym in the morning, I'll be like, right, I'll do everything now. I'll pack my whole bag and all I have to do is get up, eat, put the clothes on that I've already laid out and you know by doing that you've kind of cut out the thought process of the morning you know trying to what's your view on that do you think there's only such because I know like you said when you've studied for 90 minutes I found that at night sometimes you're just looking at notes and I'm taking notes but I'm not none of it's going in because it's 10 to 11 p.m Mm -hmm. you've had a full day of being up and you've done so much stuff and it's just mindless isn't it you're like, right, yeah. I need to shut this off and I'll come back to it tomorrow morning and you'll be so much more productive. Yeah, I, I definitely think that productivity dissipates over time, especially if you're spending time on something. So an experience I had in a similar vein was that when I did my, my lecture, my lecture was at six o'clock at night and it was an hour and a half lecture where I was just talking the entire time and it was a lot of difficult concepts and tying things together that don't normally go together so that was that was tough for me because that whole day I was just I basically meditated for the entire day because I was just trying to not spend any of my yeah my psychological resources elsewhere and even when I do podcasts I try to do them early in the morning so that I I have a full day after this like this is my I joke with Randy this is my sabbath this is my day of rest because I'll I'll do a bunch of stuff in the morning and then I'll do my podcast I normally finish it around 1 and then after that I I go and have a beer maybe if that's something that I want to do or I'll 
I'll just hang out and relax and I just won't do any more work throughout the day because that's my my one day of rest. Randy and I have been talking a lot about the the concept of time, particularly in religious practices. But even to go on to more of a an empirical sense for your point, there's a, a book called Think Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And in that he discusses the same thing that you're talking about, the amount of good decisions we have per day. Yeah. And I don't want to get this wrong, but I'm likely to. It was if if people were subjected to physical exercise and then they were given a tough decision to make, the likelihood of them deciding the tough, but you could call it the right decision, was increased by them having some kind of sucrose drink, some kind of sugar drink, some kind of thing that uh, capped off their their psychological or their uh, their fuel, you could say. So it was. I thought that was an interesting finding because I, I think you're totally right. We do have only a certain amount of resources per day, and that's influenced not only by the, our baseline, but also what kind of food you're eating, what kind of drinks you're having, what kind of vitamins you're taking. So that that adds another layer of complexity to all of this. Is that you can't just get up every day and expect yourself to be the best all the time while you're eating wagon wheels, something that I like to do as a child. What, what's interesting is, is uh, I hate to talk about sport all the time. When you relate to sport about evening games, I've had this discussion with many people about playing at certain times. And it, it does affect, like you said, if you've had a full day, and especially if you're a student athlete and you've studied all day and then you have a night game and you've got two hours and, and, Sport is, make, is, is basically just making decisions, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, and if you've just psychologically, mentally spent the whole day and then you've got to play at night, it, it, it takes a toll, definitely, I find. And, and there's an interesting research topic, I think, about the effect it, it does have. I'm sure there's research out there about it, about athletes focusing on, on different times. Um, and I've definitely got more into that. I've read. I think everyone watched it last year, but the Last Dance mm-hmm. documentary. I don't know you were a big Phil Jackson fan, anyway. Yeah. And yeah, it was a book over here. The Eleven Rings one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I watched that, and it just felt like he almost wasn't a coach of the sport. He just said, "Everyone's amazing players here, and when you're playing at that high level, it's just about." You know, basketball is not the main focus there. It's just about being able to perform at that, that level, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, everyone's, everyone's an amazing player. It's just about being able to focus in on them, them moments. Um, and then you've got the elite person of doing that, Michael Jordan, of just completely focusing, mm-hmm. being able yeah. to, to be productive in them, in them moments. Um, like you said, there's times probably like a fifth set in volleyball, you know, it's it's the shortest set, but it's the time you have to be the most productive, isn't it? You've spent mm-hmm. two hours playing, and psychologically, you're you're spent, and it's that's what separates the good and the great, isn't it? Being able to to perform at that psychologically spent period, I guess. Yeah, it's the Dale Carnegie's being your best when your best is needed. Yeah, 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 definitely. I think in my experience as a coach, I. I've come to understand it more as your ability to connect with people rather than teach people a skill. I think the first part of coaching is being able to connect with people and a huge part of it is developing trust. Oh, massively. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like, you know, the coaches you've had through your time and you probably still speak to the ones that you trust the most, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And yeah, they, they take that away. Don't they? The, the um they almost take the sport out of it and it's just them teaching you about life isn't it mm-hmm. and, you know the sports are secondary to it but then you perform so much better you know and you're willing to run through a brick wall for someone you trust as well you know like, like you said with pat you'd probably do anything for pat you know yeah so then when he's got i don't know that that season you had all them guys that are fourth and fifth years you had scp and charlie mm-hmm. you know you've got a team that have built up trust and it's like a band of brothers really then, isn't it? You know? Mm-hmm. 
and you're going to perform so much better, better from that. Yeah. Uh, going back, you were saying about, do you practice, are you, uh, are you religious? Do you practice? Uh, it's an interesting question. I, I'm not really sure how to answer it. Uh, okay. I, it's, it's quite a personal question. I know. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, um, I, I read a lot of religious texts. I wouldn't say that I, I go to church. Um, I'm actually reading a book right now called Zealot by Riza Aslan. And it's about the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And, yeah. but I mean, before that, I, like, I'm, I, I read about mythology and cottage, read a book by Grant Hamcock called America Before. And it was a, a really cool exploration into basically the thesis of this is that there was an ancient civilization in North America that was one of the most advanced civilizations in the world. And essentially what they did was sent out people into different, different areas, different countries. They were a seafaring community that sent people out and made what you would call sleeper cells of culture. And those ended up manifesting themselves down the line. And so an example of that would be uh, in in Ohio, there's something called Serpent Mound. I think it's Ohio. I'm pretty sure it's Ohio. And Serpent Mound follows the astrological structure of Draco, which is a, a big dragon, and or, or Scorpio. And that also is the same structure in Cambodia. And there are also, there are also uh, like mound pyramids in the Mississippi River Basin that are the same in structure to the pyramids in Egypt, which are structured after Orion's belt and the yeah. mythology crosses over as well. And so I'm, I'm really, I am very, very interested in religion. I wouldn't say that I'm someone that practices a particular religion. I would say I'm more spiritual maybe, but I also think that religion is the, like, an ethical foundation for our civilization and I think that there have been, there, there are so many things encoded into religion that have made society successful in the past. And I'm thinking more and more that we abandon those at our peril. So that's, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I hope I somewhat answered your question with a yeah, more, no, a it's... confusing statement. And like, like I said, I, got, I don't go to, well, I actually do go to church every now and then. I went to church with Morgan um, once or twice. And like, I'll go to temple. I'll go to a monastery. Uh, I, I just really like seeing different cultures and I love learning as much as I can about them. And they're all so similar. They're all so similar. And that's, that's kind of this guy's hypothesis is that all of the, the majority of religions are all stemming from one ancient religion that was able to move throughout the world. It's interpretation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because I've, um, I've had this conversation with lots of people and uh, it's, it's interesting because in, in school, we learned about the Mormon religion right and this this sounds really bad but and, and this wasn't in religious studies class it's in history class and they showed us an episode of south park where they spoke about but they did the book of mormon mm -hmm. and i always remember at the end of it the the, the family and I, I hate to talk about this and sorry if i've offended anyone but it's something that's always stuck with me he said about and the, the mormon kid said in the in the cartoon said whether Joseph Smith or any of this is real, it doesn't matter. I, I live my life by what it says and I'm, I live a happy life and I'm kind to people and that's it. You know, it, it could be real, it could be not. But the guidelines, well, not the, the guidelines, the, the story told by the Book of Mormon I live by and that's what makes me happy. So that's that, you know, and I'm kind to people and, and that's it. And I think that's, that's something that's always stuck with me definitely when people speak about religion. Is some people are like it might not be real, but I'm happy where I'm at right now, and that's the rule is to it, you know. Mm -hmm. We, I, 
I'm not sure what I think about the metaphysics of it in terms of the man in the clouds with the big beard. Yeah. I, yeah. I've never seen him, so I, I can't say much to that. But I do think that it creates an ethical framework for anybody who studies it. And the more I've been looking a lot into the education system lately, and there, there's no real ethical. So essentially, there was this. Western society has been built up around Christianity. So there's this ethical framework built into the Bible and the teachings in the Bible, love thy neighbor and he who is without sin cast the first stone. And so there are all of these ethical teachings that were, we more or less took for granted, I think, in hindsight. And now that we've removed the religious aspect, so the entire, the cornerstone or the foundation of that, we've essentially removed that and we're hoping that things don't fall apart underneath it after removing a concrete foundation. And the more that I see about it, the more that I think I am a little bit freaked out by the removal of that. And I, I grew up in a, in a Catholic household. I went to church every Sunday until I was- Oh wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, and I hated it. I absolutely oh, really? hated it. Yeah, absolutely despised it. Um, hated, hated, <laughs> hated the church, really didn't like religion wasn't a fan at all uh even in turn like i came from a my mom and dad split up before i was basically as i was born so i was also not a fan of marriage because my dad was always really skeptical and didn't he that was that was a big regret of his was getting so married do you, um so i to put you off because you don't speak about it but you still speak to your do you see your mom and dad now mm -hmm. oh, and you saw them all growing up when you were younger yeah so my mom, I didn't see from about the time I, I think I was 11 or 12 until I was about 20. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And you didn't speak at all really between no. them? And them? No, it was about nine, nine or 10 years of just. Did you make that move to speak to her? So Pat was a, Pat was a big proponent of that actually. I remember oh, wow. sitting down and so I almost failed out in my first year and lost my scholarship and then i pat sat me down in a room and said to me hey well i think you're either gonna be a millionaire or you're gonna be homeless one day so you have to start making choices between those two <laughs> and and i think that's kind of actually when my life got more real than anything else i was a big victim until then is in okay as in anything that happened it was like ah poor me uh, yeah. the world's not fair everything everything sucks this is all suffering and so i think after that point i more or less turned my philosophy around and said what can i do to pat, pat basically he more or less gave me a framework of heaven and hell he said <laughs> here's a million dollars yeah and here's homelessness go go pick yeah and so then after that he he said that as a father he it would break his heart every day if he wasn't able to see any of his kids and so he told me that maybe i should go and contact my mom so i called my mom and cried on the phone for the oh. duration of the time that we talked yeah i mean it was weird i hadn't i hadn't heard her voice in in nine or ten years so maybe it was a little bit maybe it wasn't as long as that but long enough that i yeah so and it's a i mean it's a part of you it's a I know, I know that you have a, an estranged relationship with your father. And so it's, and I know you, I, and, I, you and I I'm, talked about that. I'm in a different mindset yeah. to, what, to what you are and whether that's me as a person. Um, and yeah, I, I, get, I get what Pat said. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting because this is something I've been going through the last couple of months. And, and, and in my opinion, I'd never, I'd never speak to my my father even she came back into my life and me and my my mom spoke about it and she said that when i was growing up one of my uh, childhood friends his he never liked playing soccer and i always did as a kid and his dad said to my mom he was like i, I couldn't understand all i wanted ever is my boy to play and he was like how harry's dad couldn't harry lives with himself harry does not seeing all this and seeing what you're doing and 
yeah, my, my, my opinion is different. And I flip it and say that they're the ones that lost out, not, not me. Mm-hmm. I never, you know, well, I never lost out. I had amazing, my mum's been amazing and my, my granddad and my, my stepdad. Um, so I'd never, it's interesting to see that you're, you're in that, that mindset of you found that was what the missing piece. And as, do you think that's been the missing piece from then? That, I think that helped me to develop a, a wholeness in my own life. I, I wouldn't say there was, that was all of it. There was a lot of stuff missing that I had to work on. Not even missing, I'd say. I just had to find it. It was always, it was in there. I just had to have the right pressures put on to kind of force me into finding that. But I I mean, I was also, I loved my mom as a kid growing up. We were super duper close and it was just one somewhat isolated event that led to a relationship cataclysm. And so I think us getting back in touch was a, a really good thing for me. And like you said, I, I think that there are tons of people that wouldn't have that same feeling about reconnecting with a parent. I do think that it, you, you realize some things because you, they're half of you to some extent. As I've grown older, I've realized like my mom's a huge negative visualizer and I get that from her and she thinks about dying all the time and I get that from her. And so there were things that didn't really make sense to me before we were able to talk as adults. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's interesting. It is it is half of, of you, I guess. Um, yeah, and I'm sure there's lots of people that are in the same situation, aren't they? But going back with saying everyone has different, everyone's different in a way. It's not the same, is it? Mm-hmm. It's not the the same relationship. Like like you said, you grew up with your mum, yeah. whereas I I I can't even remember. It was four when I left, so. Mm-hmm. You know, there's not not too much I can really remember, so it's like I never. To me, it never happened, you know. Yeah. So, it's in, whereas if you said if it was eleven, it might be different, but in my eyes, it's it, it's not. Yeah, it's something that there's definitely something I've I've thought about the last couple of months. Definitely not not in a way of ever him getting back in my life, but definitely, like you said, when you get older, you have questions, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm quite old school in the way that I'd be like, why, you know, you have to face up and tell, tell me why you did that. Oh, that's a, that's a high on the list question. Why? Very, very testosterone based question, isn't it? It's very man. Like you need to look me in the eyes and tell me why you did that. And I remember speaking to John about it and you know, he's like, what, what would you gain from that? You know, there's nothing, there's nothing you're going to, you're going to get from that. So if you don't want them in your life, there's what, what's the point in, having that conversation there's nothing you're going to gain from it really so yes yeah, it's, it's interesting well you got to see your mom step up as well i mean my, my dad oh, my, was the same my dad we, we say huge. the same my i know everyone uh says that about the person. my mom's the goat like the absolute goat she's just if you could sit down and speak to her yeah and she just got on with life you know my mom worked multiple jobs and did everything for us. And it's only until you get old, you look back and realize that because growing up in it, you don't think anything about it. You know, you Mm -hmm. don't see your mum doing all this and the stuff they do to provide. And my granddad is pretty much my dad and my stepdad came into my life when I, as I got older. So I never, I never missed out, but yeah, they talking about, and it's interesting to say because you're talking about resilience. Like you found yourself in that first year where, you didn't have much and over time you've grown, whether it was always in you and you just built them, them excuses in mm-hmm. and, and, and played the victim, which everyone's done. You sit there and you're like, Oh, why this? And why that? And there's always someone else to blame. Isn't there? Well, there and was I've a study that well. came out that uh, they did brain imaging for people that play victim. And it actually, it, I, I want to say that it, uh, it activated the, same system that gets activated for for dopamine for cocaine stuff okay. like that so it was the no i won't even try to i want to say it was the nucleus accumbens but i don't i i haven't sharpened up on my neuroscience in a few months now and don't want to <laughs> say anything but but no it feels good to play victim like physically it, it feels good 
neur neurologically it feels good. And so I understand why people did it. I understand why I did it. I don't think that it's a conducive way to find success in your life. Accountability is a big one, isn't it? No. Mm -hmm. And I've definitely found that over the, the few years now. I'm a lot better at holding myself accountable athletically and academically as well. If something happened, well, oh, that was my fault. You know, definitely as a, as a player as well, I've been like, if there's a mistake, I'm like, right, that was me. You know, I know mm -hmm. I remember my, my youth team coach saying, I made a mistake. And after the game, I was thinking, oh, he's going to absolutely rip me apart here. And he said, I could rip you apart, but what's done is done. You know, it doesn't, don't even think about it. Forget it because it happened. And you can go home and think about it over and over again, but it's not going to change what, what happened there. You know, like with a test or an exam, you've done it. You've done it then, haven't you? You know, mm -hmm. it's, there's no point in thinking what if or ifs and and all that. It's, it's done. And I've definitely got a lot better. At, and it feels good when you've, like anyone knows, when you've studied and you've done, you feel you've done well. You're like, right, I did everything I could there. You know, whereas if you've half heartedly studied for what like everyone knows and you're like, you just right, submit it and it's done. You know, or you're submitting a paper at 11 55 p.m. and you're like, right, just let's just do it. And you don't mm. get that same hit of feeling good as if you've put everything into it. Um, yeah. Well, it's the, the, the effort you put in moving towards something is a part of the reward as well, because that's what helps you to learn. Kind of the same thing as going back to earlier when we're talking about the delayed gratification. A part of the reward is the work. And yeah. not, not just the work that you do, but the work that you're now becoming more capable of doing in the future. Mm. So if you're able to exercise for 30 minutes to an hour a day, you're going to be able to translate that somewhere else. Becoming better at one thing increases your ability to become better at other things that are potentially somewhat unrelated in the future. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm not sure you nailed it there. I'm not really sure, <laughs> sure what, what to say. I'm trying to think what, what else I had. I had that. Oh, I was listening to something the other day. They were talking about stress. Mm -hmm. And someone made a really good analogy. And that it might not be completely true. But again, it's interpretation. Like you said, someone might tell you something about a certain technique. And if you believe it, then, you know, in your mind, it's going to work. It's that placebo effect, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And they were saying about stress and the guy said, well, when you work out, you know, for your muscles to grow, you have to stress them and you have to hurt and growth is hurt. And he was like, I think that's the same for the mind, you know, stress does good and it lets you grow and it, it grows your mind and, and resilience to it, doesn't it? You know, there's, there's, you have to go through the hard times to to realize that and, and we've both seen that with injury and you've you've had it double over haven't you you know those those hard times and i think you have more more bad days than good days it's about riding them good days out isn't it mm -hmm. you know and and i've had that where you've had days where you wake up and you're like i really don't want to get up here or there's not much to to achieve but it's about finding things to be productive like you said reading like i've got I finish my exam tomorrow and you're like, right, well, what am I going to do now with my days? You know, there's, there's, we're just about finding stuff to be productive and making you feel good by doing that. Like you said, reading, it makes you feel good when you've done it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's definitely something I need to, to do more of is read more. You, you, you get that hit, but it's blocking out time to do it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's like them excuses you build. I'm like, all oh, right, well, I haven't got time to do that. Well, you have got time. And even if it's 10, you read 10 pages. You know, it's about starting it off, isn't it? So I've been trying to trying to conceptualize learning in terms of addiction. There was a guy I had on named Taylor Averill, and he said he has a super addictive personality, and he was trying to find ways to to optimize that into his benefit. So you could either sit around doing like smoking all day and doing blow and sitting yeah. on your phone or you could learn ways to get addicted to something that's good for you. So the way that I've been thinking about it lately is that if you're to 
if you're to learn something, it's kind of the opposite of becoming addicted to something. So when you're, when you're an addict and you're going through rehabilitation or you're trying to get off of a substance or anything, a behavior, it's finding things to do in lieu of that thing and making the environment conducive to your success in that. So you're consistently trying to move away from that thing by doing other things and filling your time. And then also trying to find pleasure in doing those other things that can make up for the pleasure that you lose from this other thing. And every day that you make it past your onset of quitting is a successful day. And so if you make it one day, two day, three day, four day, every day between that is a day that you know that you can do. And the way that I think about it is that if you make it to a hundred days and then you relapse, that's not necessarily a failure, but you've just shown yourself that you can do it for a hundred days. And so the next time that you go, you know that you can make it to a hundred days and how far you how how far can you make it past a hundred days? Yeah. And even in the sense of, um, so more, more back to being injured, like you said, each day is, each day is tough and you don't have very many good days, but then occasionally you have a good day. And then those good days become more frequent and the bad days become less frequent over time. And so it's kind yeah. of, a, of a reversal of good and bad days. And then in terms of learning, kind of tying it back to that first example of addiction and making it to your hundred days, it's how many days in a row can you do said activity? So maybe it's exercising. How many days can you go to the gym and just sit in the gym and read your, read your magazine yeah. for five minutes? And every day that you do that is another day that you're adding to your, your total of, I did this thing. Every day that you sit down and read for 10 minutes, you've added another day. And then you take a day off and you go, it's not that you took a day off. It's that you made it to that day. You've made it 10 days, 20 days, a hundred days, yeah. and then you took one off. So you know that you can make it that 30 days. And now it's about making it 30 days and then putting another day onto that. And it's just day by day, moment by moment. That's the way I've been thinking about it more so lately is just moment by moment. How can I prepare myself for the future? How can I, I look down the, the road in a year, three years, five years. How, how can I serve that person? Ahead? Lately, I've been doing it more. Uh, I'm, that's not my natural proclivity. I'm far more of a, in the moment, very, like I'm, I'm very adventurous. I like to do things spontaneously. I don't really like to have a plan. Even, even in terms of my day, like me reading for a few hours and then working out and doing the dog stuff. That's just something that I've tried to develop over time. That's not natural at all. I'm far more of a, spontaneous do this and then do that and then do this and have no schedule no nothing but it makes me far more efficient to do that and the five-year plan is less of a concrete thing to work towards but more of a conceptual framework that i have that i think that if i put as much into myself as i physically and mentally and emotionally spiritually everything that i can do if i put all of that into myself I think I could be a pretty cool human being that I would look up to in five years. Yeah. So in that sense, it's, it's more or less my responsibility to do those things if I want to be that person. And, not, and kind of as you were talking about yesterday, you can only make so many good decisions in a day. So it's about figuring out the thing. You're, you're constantly doing a cost-benefit analysis. So something that I try to do is increase my desire to do, to make the right choice something so if i see some garbage on the side of the road and go oh well, that's shitty yeah. that someone put garbage there well I, you and i because remember when i i did yeah, my achilles we went out. We yeah went I would, out every, garbage yeah, yeah every sunday i would go onto the highway and pick up garbage for a few hours and then you came out and we'd clean up the whole highway and then the next week we'd go back and it would be yeah filthy again and it was just this thing of maybe there's a maybe there's a, an amount of garbage that needs to be on the highway but at the same time, like if you, if you do that every single day, then, and people start to pick up on that as well. I think that's where friendships come in that actually lift you up is when people see you doing cool stuff and they, you attract those people, those people push you because they also start doing cool stuff. It's kind of, you develop a, a weird idealization of each other. Yes. It's similar it's to surrounding you with people, isn't it? And yeah. The right. And I said that with COVID you've kind of, especially what I've done, I've, you've 
kind of narrowed down those things that don't pay off to you that you did, you mm-hmm. know, that, and it sounds brutal, but some of the, the, the friendships you might have had, like, like I maybe, like you said, with the conversations you have weekly, you maybe speak to two, three people, you know, in a day I might message maybe two, three people, you know, and one of them's my mum. I'll probably more than that because more my sister on there. But yeah, you, you narrow down those those relationships and the ones that actually give you something and you know, those those right people that are around you that, that do drive you and they, they want to do the right stuff where I know it's difficult now, you can't see people, but for instance, looking back, I'd rather have a friend to me say, All right, let's go study or let's go do this or let's go pick up garbage instead of saying, Right, let's go grab a drink, you know, because mm-hmm. It's making you and them a better person by doing that, you know. But it's not until you get older you, or going through that, you see that, you know, those, those relationships that didn't, didn't pay you off. Yeah. Another, another thing about that is that you idealize people. And yeah. not, in a, not in a negative connotation, I've definitely idealized, idealized my fair share of partners and had that tank relationships in the past. But a part of that is when you idealize someone and they idealize you, you can actually work towards that that character that you've created. You're 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 putting something above the person that they almost couldn't be, and in that sense, it's something for that person to strive towards. So, you're more or less giving them a role model for themselves, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, let's say you and I have a relationship, and obviously, you and I have a relationship, and and I come to you, and I I think well. Harry loves to, Harry likes to study. Harry likes to do well in school. Yeah. And that's my idealized version of you. And then I come to you and say, hey, Harry, do you want to go and study? And maybe you've had a, a long day. And that's me putting an idealization onto you, thinking that yeah. you're going to want to study. And then in some sense, you either have to live up to that or not live up to that. Yeah. And, and in, in that way, you can fit someone's idealization of you to become a better version of yourself and yeah. I'm, I'm not saying it's healthy all the time but there are aspects of it that are healthy and like when i when i've had relationships in the past the first month of being with someone i'm never on my phone ever even oh, longer actually true. like normally i'll normally throughout the relationship i'll pretty much stop going on my phone because that's something that they value in me and that's something that i value in myself and only when i start to let that slip away is when like towards maybe the end of a relationship or something, but I, I tend to live a more ideal version of myself. I clean more and I'm on my phone less and being more spontaneous and adventurous and doing all of these things that I see them having value that I, that I see them valuing in me and that I in turn actually value in myself. And so it's a, a mixture between kind of trimming that idealized version of you into who you actually are and who you actually could be at the same time yeah it's interesting yeah maybe. i always, I always learn stuff speaking to you just a thought i don't know maybe it may like, maybe it works out maybe it's uh something that people can use as a framework i think that it's it's helped me to understand myself a little bit better especially in relationships and the thing that you're doing you always want to be your own role model, right? The thing that you you kind of you want to be the person that you you are in front of kids. Yeah, yeah. Like, and so how do you? And so I think a big part of that is openly acknowledging who you are and understanding your faults, and then also understanding the things that you're really good at, and lean into the things that you're good at, and over time try to have those overtake and also bring up the the parts of yourself that you're maybe not so super stoked about so well it, it was interesting you were speaking about we were talking about before about being open with teammates and one of my favorite soccer players joey barton when he was at a team he's quite he's really into sports psychology has a really good podcast and he said when i was there the the team psychologist came in and he listed kind of the personality traits of everyone like strengths and weaknesses what they are and he said i, I put it on my locker and he said, so everyone could see it. He said, you know, that's, that's it. I want everyone to, to not, you know, I'm being as open as possible. That's, that's who I am. And, and he said, it helped me build so many more relationships, even though my flaws, there's something I want to get rid of, but there's something I always have to 
kind of embrace as well, aren't they? Mm-hmm. You know? and, and that's that helps you trust people, and you've got to kind of embrace your flaws to a point, haven't you? And you know that I'm quite a realist in in what I I I do. I'm not an optimist or a pessimist, but I'm quite a realist in in goals I set. Um, and that's even something that, I, that that I've got to be better at, you know, is is and being open to a point because I know you don't want to be that person that you know they're like, oh god, there's Harry, he's going to go on about stuff, and and it's choosing the right people to speak to that about as well because I remember we always had a conversation about, and it's that that Wolfpack curse where you walk through university and you see other athletes, you don't know them. But you kind of have that awkward, hey, how with anyone? You're like, how's it going? Good, mm-hmm. yeah, you, yeah, and you're like, well, or you might have a couple minute conversation. It sounds really bad, but you're like, I really don't know you that well to be having that conversation. Or we had that conversation where it's like, you might be on a bad day, just stop and say, oh no, I'm, I'm actually not, no, and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, tell me about it. <laughs> But you want to have them conversations with the right people if you're not feeling right, you know? Mm -hmm. Because it's pointless having it with people that you don't have a rapport with or a relationship with, I I find, anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think you make a, number one, a very good point about having a solid foundational friend group where you're actually able to go and tell them the things that are bothering you and they're going to support you. Then you can also tell them the things that that are going well in your life and they're not going to brush you off and I think you make another good point about integrating the parts of yourself that you don't like rather than putting them into the closet and hoping they'll go away you actually have to understand them and then once you understand them you're able to manifest them into a a a more productive set of skills yeah yeah definitely well my phone's just gone got a new phone I'm done out of work yet so it keeps going off (laughs) Because I, 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 I knew I've, I have my old iPhone, but it stopped mm-hmm. working, and mm-hmm. it was a bit blessing because it was like two weeks ago, and I was like, I'm just gonna leave it, and I did for like a week. I didn't have a phone for a week, and it was great. Feels yeah. good. It does. It does, and because I still checked like social. I just got on my laptop at night, mm-hmm. so you're still kind of getting that feed, but it was better. It was I had more meaning to it because I was like, all right, oh, I haven't seen this. Whereas if I go on it now, you're seeing content you've already already seen and it sounds but i never take my phone to the gym or rarely i do not if if i want to work out music i do but i'll just stick it in airplane mode or whatever because then when you open it up you've actually got stuff to look at or you've had people that might have texted you or whatever so it's it's that feeling of like right well it actually feels good instead of just checking it every every two minutes where you're going to get the same content and like we said about in the mornings is great because if you get up really early, there's no one really to talk to, or there's no distractions, or no one's posting stuff. So it's it's an optimum time, isn't it? Yeah, I found that, like you said, checking my phone less. I try to check it in the morning and then at night. It's a little bit tougher if I am having conversations. I, I'll try to have phone conversations that are scheduled now yeah. rather than impromptu conversations because those just I, I find those tend to work a lot better for me mentally. I am, I definitely struggle more mentally when I'm consistently checking my phone because I think that's a, that becomes a sink for, that just becomes a well for positive emotion, especially with doing, I mean, especially with doing the, the podcast, I found it was way more beneficial for me to check my phone once a day rather than consistently checking, consistently checking, seeing if people are seeing if they're liking your stuff or commenting yeah. or asking questions and getting DMs. And it's just so volatile when you're checking it all the time because you'll go through a period where you get six messages from a clip and people want to talk about it and you get super into it. And then you'll post a, I'll post a clip and I won't get any messages. Like, well, was that a bad clip? Was that, yeah. was that this? Was that that? Rather than, I think if I wait, then it also takes the, the load off of that that isolated incident and maybe if i get a message from randy on facebook or snapchat then i'm getting something 
I think that's all I'm really looking for when I check my phone is that I'm, I'm getting something, I'm being validated in some way. Yeah. And so that's what it is, isn't it? It's really oh, totally. Well, I, and like I said, I'll, I, I try to understand the things about myself that I'm not super fond of so that I can integrate them into myself. And that that's probably one of them is being as open as I can about, or as not, maybe not open, but as honest as I can about my relationship with social media. Because if I say, wow, I'm, it's a very healthy relationship. Social media is super healthy. It's unbiased, non-echo chamber, that kind of stuff. I, I think that becomes dangerous because then like, there, is, there is some toxicity to it. I'm learning more there's, and more. About I think there's that. lots of benefits to social media as well. Yeah, absolutely. Because mm-hmm. I, have, I have conversations with... I, I'm, I'm not a massive user, but I, I post quite a lot of photos. I probably post every few weeks, give a couple few weeks. And lot, I have a conversation with lots of people, you know, so many people overthink what they're posting. I'm mm-hmm. like, I have a photo here. There's people, I mean, mainly my, my mum and stuff. <laughs> I, I, I just post, you know, and they can see. And I'm like, I like the photo, so I'm going to post it. And that's it. Mm-hmm. One person can like it or 200 people can like it. it honestly, it, people probably say I'm like, it really doesn't bother me how many people like my photo. I like posting it, so that's all that really matters. And then there's a few people that, you know, I, I do care if they, they liked it, you know, that I'm like, uh, my mum hasn't liked it. I'm like, oh, mum, what you've done here? Is it a bad photo <laughs> of people? But they're the people that you surround, the, the people that are close to you, you know? Mm-hmm. And I said before, I've narrowed, narrowed that down over the, 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 the past year. I've probably narrowed that down to people. Like you said, you have more meaningful conversations with them than you do a hundred people, you know? How do you think you've done that? COVID's definitely been a big thing. I think you found the people, because it, 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 it made for more quality time like that. This time last year was when you couldn't really see people, but you could go out and sit. Like I'd sit apart with people and you'd, but it's the people that want to do that, you know, or they, they want to go for a walk and they just sit and talk. You don't have to be drinking or you don't have to be doing that. And you, I definitely found cutting, cutting that out you know like you said you've been out drinking you're talking to people and you're like i have nothing in common with this person but we're a few drinks deep so we're going to keep having this conversation in the group and it's it's interesting when you do that and i have more quality conversations with less people now than i'd have more quantitative conversations with a lot more people and it's definitely i think made me made me a, a better person um for sure and and I'm, I'm not minimalist, but simplifying things in my life has definitely made it a lot better, I, I find. And doing stuff that makes you happy and, and not worrying about what other people think. Because I'm, I'm a massive overthinker. I, I overthink a lot of stuff. Um, and a lot of, a lot of meaningful, uh, meaningless stuff. Um, I definitely... So I, I don't think I, I suffered, but I had this real bad phase. And I actually spoke to uh, someone I know, Matt, and, and he had it really bad. And, it, and I don't think I, I had it in any way, but I'd sometimes delve into that where he said he suffered from a form of OCD. It's like intrusive thoughts, where he had really bad ones, where you know he'd think someone's coming for him or he'd feel he's wanted by the police for something he hasn't done. It just really overthink that. And I had a phase where I'd leave the house and I'd be convinced I left the door wide open. I'd be, I, there was multiple times I'd be at super, I'd run home. I'd be like, I left the cooker on. I know I did. <laughs> and I, I'd, or I'd be like, I left my balcony wide open. And I, I'm absolutely convinced I did. And I'd be, I'd be out with people and I'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to have to go home now. And I wouldn't tell them why, but I'd go home and just check. Or I'd be asleep and I'd be like, the front door's wide open. I know it is. And I'd go up and it's completely locked. But I, I just overthink that all the time. And I never really suffer with it bad, but there was a phase this time last year and I was just overthinking it all. I'd be like, right, I, I left the oven on. I know I left it on. And I'd go upstairs and check it and I'd come back down. And I'd be like, what if I knocked it on my way down? And it, 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 it drove me insane. There were so many sleepless nights I had where I'd be worrying about stuff like that. And he taught me a cool trick where he said, when you, and I still do it now when I leave, like make a noise when you lock the door. And then later in the day, when you make that noise, you remember you did it. 
So I had a real phase of like clicking. I'd be like, it's like when I'd lock the door, I'd leave and I'd go. And then like a couple hours later, I'd be like, oh, did I lock it? And I'd make that noise and I'd subconsciously remember me locking it, which is quite an interesting, interesting trick. Um, and it's funny because I never really told people I, I did that. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a real bad phase I had where I just put myself in the worst situations where I'd, I'd be convinced I'd done so. And I put my screensaver on my phone was just a note that I put saying, you've turned everything off. You've done it all. Don't worry about it, which did help a bit. But yeah, and I couldn't give you a reason why I was thinking like that. I don't know what it was. I was going to ask, was there a surrounding context? I really couldn't tell you. I don't, since like August, September onwards, and whether that was the relationships I had had since then. Um, and like, like, I don't know. I really don't know why, why I had them. Um, I mean, that was a, it was a rough time. Obviously I, I came back here after my rehab and seizing up canceled school. And I think a lot of people did, did suffer quite a bit. Um, and I don't know. I don't know what the variables were, but I'm a lot better with that stuff. But that was a real bad phase where I'd, I'd be out and about and I'd run home. I'd drop, I've dropped multiple groceries in Superstore and just like, I have, I've done, I know something's happened and someone's in my house or something like that. It got to a real stage of like paranoia where I'd just sit awake at night thinking, oh God, this, something's going to happen or a fire's going to happen or, or something like that. And it was only, and I didn't suffer really bad like, like my friend Matt did. But when he told me about it, it's only until you kind of realize you accept, it's accepting it, isn't it? I think there's, there's not a point. I've never, ever been depressed in my life. I have, a, I have a great life. I've never been at that stage. But there's definitely stages where everyone's suffered, isn't they? I think it's accepting that, being like, right, I, I'm having a weak period right now. And what can I do to, to make this better? And the people around you make that better. You know, I could have a conversation with someone two years ago and, looking back i probably thought they cared but they really didn't you know whereas now the last nine months i'd have conversations i know the people to go to and speak about that and they actually help you in that that way don't they what do you think the impact of hearing that someone else went through that was it helped so much it definitely did matt matt helped me a lot um and obviously his was much more severe but it's like all right someone's actually because when I was telling people, I, I felt like I was insane when I was telling them. Like I'm, and that was my biggest fear. I was like, people are just going to think I'm crazy if I tell them what's, what's happening. And I did, and a few people were like, oh, you know, they didn't know what to say. But Matt was like, I get it. He was like, I completely I understand. And I was like, wow, he does, yeah. You know, and it, it, felt, it felt unbelievable. And, and you might have had the same where, and I guess that's what, um, and then obviously it's not on this scale, but think about it. No, that's, that's what um, rehab is, isn't it? For some people who have addictions, where they get in a room with everyone with the same problem, and it's probably that that they're like, wow, everyone here has the same same issue. But being someone who's been through it definitely helped a lot. I found like community building essentially. That's what you're doing at a micro scale is finding other people with a similar issue and then understanding the way that they have dealt with that in the past and they become somewhat of a guide for you. Yeah, but, but, but this time last year was a real tough period for me, I found. I think it was coming, I obviously made the decision to come back and then I was still kind of fresh off. I was what, six months after my surgery. So I was kind of like, I couldn't really train. Like, you know, that period where you, a big part of it's sport and that gets taken away. And even exercise, I couldn't really mm -hmm. run. So that gets taken away and you're like, right, everything starts to close down. I think it was just a period. But I don't know what, what brought that on. And I haven't had that, that in, in ages where I've had thoughts like that. But definitely speaking to him where he said, yep. He said, yep. I was like, oh, he was like, yeah. I said, I understand what, what you're thinking. Um, and I, I encourage more people to do that. It's finding the right people to, to talk about. Like even talking about it now, I don't... I never want to be open about my whole life to people that know about my life, the people that I want to know about it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and 
I've never really been open, to be honest. I've definitely kept my myself to myself. And this is more even open. You know, me and my mum had that conversation last week. And I don't think we've really had a deep conversation about my dad and ever. And that's been 20 years, you know. And it's it felt good, you know. It's kind of one of those things where you just get it off your chest, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's like, right? Because there's not... It wasn't something that was bothering me. It was just more I felt like because I got older and more aware and I think the more time I spent by myself I thought wow my mum probably had so many nights like this where she was by herself and I think that's what hit me I was like wow you know the how did she feel about that and that was what more bothered me than than myself um and I'd never and it's I don't want to name drop here but that's a conversation I never had with mum if it wasn't for Harriet telling me to you know, I'd never, you know, and that's something that that her and her family have, have I've definitely learned about being open to each other and talking about everything. Because it does help, doesn't it? You know, but it's mm-hmm. the right people to do it to. I'm not going to go out and speak to a random or tell, or, or I think it's great that people do go on social media and talk about it. I'd never do it because um, that's just not, well, I think that's something I'd do. Like you said, the people that know about it, I know about the people that don't, don't. Um, but I do think it's, it's, and definitely male mental health as well has got so much more prominent, I think. Um, and that masculinity, I definitely found that. And growing up with my mum and sister, I think I always tried to play that role of being like, right, I'm the man here, you know. Well, I'm actually, anyone that knows me, I'm pretty big softy, to be honest. You know, I'll, I'll sit and watch Marley and me and this is us and cry all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I think, and it's great seeing all that and like your podcast, you see people talk about it and, you know, it it, it is interesting to see. And I think a lot more people have issues than you think, you know? Um, Yeah. And it's, it's, there's, there's variance to it. You, like I said, well, I'm speaking about it now. I've never ever been depressed or, you know, I've never ever thought, but everyone's had tough times where they've thought, you know, they're like, oh, this is a low point, and, you know, but I've never ever been to a really extreme extent and I'd never want to. And, and the interesting thing about Matt was because Matt's, Matt's a soccer player and he played at quite a high level. And it was nice to hear someone who's, you think, has got it all that has the same issues, you know. And I think it's a big thing for student athletes because I think people from the outside look at it think right you know you've kind of got everything when in theory you know you're trying to balance so much like I, I had this conversation with Pete about if you've played bad on a weekend I'm thinking about that all week until the next game but I've got classes to do I've got work physical work you have so much to it but your mind's just focused on that one thing and I did drive me insane my second year you'd just be thinking about it all the time and it'd put you off your whole week. You wouldn't be able to focus and you'd be like, right, I played bad last weekend. Am I going to start this weekend? And in class, you'd drift off and start thinking. I'm like, no, I'm like, why did I do that? There was no need for me to even do that. But you've gone through it and that's it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You learn through that that period and you're probably the same. You've gone through stuff and like, why did I even think of that? It's got nothing, nothing to do. And I, I, I do think about long term and um, I'm not a religious person, but someone gave me a note one time and it was a verse from the Bible and it's, oh, I've, got, I've got it up here. It's um, the book of Matthew, Matthew 6, 34. And it says, what's it say? It says, therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So I kind of look at that every day and I'm not a religious person anyway, but I'm kind of like, right, here's today. What am, I, what am I going to do today? And I had this conversation with someone about, they asked me if I had any regrets. And I was like, and if someone asked me right in this very second, I'm like, well, right in this very second, I'm happy. I'm having a conversation with you about stuff. So no, because if I did something different five years ago or a year ago, it might not, I might not be sitting here right now speaking to you on here. So, no, I don't have any regrets on stuff I, I, I did. 
So that's what I kind of kind of look at. I definitely think long term, but I'm like, right, take each day as it comes, and you know, every day is kind of, you know, I don't want to sound cheap. Every day is a gift, isn't it? And you have to mm-hmm. take advantage of that. And I, I try to sit there and think about. It. And definitely, the people I was surrounding me with made me think about that more. Um, you know, and that's something definitely like a kind of dropper. But but Harriet proud to me. You know, every day you go out and do stuff you want to do. You know. And something I, I, I try to do for sure. And I know you do that as well. And the people I surround myself with do do that, you know, every day, right? Don't waste a day. Mm-hmm. Let's try learn something a day. Try learn a new word or maybe, you know. Get a little bit better. That 1%, 1% better every day. And you'll end up being, being a better version of yourself. I think it all me what it is, isn't it? It's trying to be the best version of yourself. and. I definitely hopefully think I'm on my way to achieving that. Yeah, I so, think in my yeah. in my study of myth as of late, that has been the core theme is becoming the best version of you. And that's that's mm-hmm. what I've I've tried to base my activity around is becoming the best version of myself. I've definitely found the last while I've realized more of a purpose. I should serve in life in terms of a career. Um, Cause I think everyone's had that stage when you're like 18, 19, where you're like, right, I'm going to make so much money. Like I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to make so much money. I'm going to have all that. But then I'm like, you, you've been put on this earth for a, for a purpose. And most, I'm really not asked about money now. And there's this, and that sounds not in a way of, I'll work for free the rest of my life. But as long as I've got money to do the stuff that I want to do and I can get by, then that's that. You know, I'd rather provide a service for people and help people out. And like you're saying about you with your TikTok, there's people that have access. I wrote a paper for a medical sociology class and it was about access to healthcare. And obviously Canada's pretty, pretty fortunate in the healthcare system. There's still people that, that don't get it or full access. And it was about something indigenous communities and it sounds very bad I can't remember his name there was a a child called Jordan I forgot his last name and he was an indigenous child in uh, Manitoba who had really bad medical issues and the federal and provincial government were arguing about who's going to cover the cost and in the Mm -hmm. meantime he he passed away and they, they passed a law Jordan's law where every indigenous child should have the access to it um and I wrote a paper about how the Canadian government spent so many billions on fighter jets a year, yet there's still people in the country who don't have access to free healthcare. You know, like you said, there's people in third world countries where the government are spending billions of dollars or, and there's still people that don't have access to clean water, you know, which is, is shocking. And if you can make, I said, if I can make a difference in, you know, a 0.001% difference in providing something like that to someone, then I've, I'd die a happy person, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's, because I think people, I listened to a podcast with a doctor who was working with glioblastoma and he said that, he was like, I know I'm not going to cure it, but if I can do something that helps it move along and someone in a hundred years can, but I've contributed to that, then I'll, that's my purpose, you know, it's kind of short term of goals, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, that's something that I've been trying to do with with this. That was a an you could say it's an unexpected consequence that I received a few messages from people that listen. And one girl said she was going to university because she listened to my episode with someone that's going into traditional Chinese medicine. And then another friend messaged me saying, that's "Amazing, hey, yeah, yeah." Someone someone said, "Hey, I listened to your episode with." Uh, with this guy and now I'm reconnecting with my mom because I I told the story of me and my mom and so that's been my I tend to be very open but I try to keep things a little bit more private and I've been opening up more and more on this because people people tend to respond to it and kind of like you said when you hear someone else going through that and you understand what they've been through it's a little bit easier because you find community and I've been more open I probably should have on this podcast but you just speak I didn't plan anything mm-hmm. talking about no, that and, and 
and there's probably some people that hear this i'm like oh they didn't need to hear that but um i think it's scaling down like you said if you can help one person you know so make like your videos of your rehab if that helps one person mm -hmm. you know it's not about trying to help i don't know what it is about but you've got to realize that you're not going to reach millions of people you might do but if you make one person's life better or they've done like you said someone listens to your podcast and they've done that and that's amazing that's that's mm -hmm. the and that's the pros of social media and podcasts and yeah stuff like that that you reach someone that's and that that's i think that's the sole purpose of it isn't it of of social media and obviously people and myself you get distance from that isn't it it's just another another platform for people to to see stuff like that and or even like you said pe being able to see someone's vulnerable is is that right wow it might someone might listen to this and be like okay well i need to speak to someone about that or i might cut out relationships that don't mean anything to me or friendships or whatever so mm -hmm. yeah yeah you're doing amazing on this i think thanks i, listen, I hope you know? i hope people are liking it they are yeah yeah definitely but there's some yeah have you had pat on you've had pat right uh you were my first and pat was my second there you go yeah so yeah. Um, I might I might get him on. I hope to get him on relatively soon. I haven't asked him yet, but I think he'd be keen. I've got to make sure that he's doing all right. But I think that would be a fun one. That'd be a good one. And like you said, you just meet new people and you ask them, don't you? you yeah, know. yeah. I've had a few people reach out, which I love. People send me a message. Hey, if you ever want to talk about anything, I there was a girl that I met traveling a few years ago, and she's from the Netherlands. And she, she's a really high level dancer and asked, Hey, if you ever want to talk about anything that I'd love to be on, I think that'd be a lot of fun. And so I'm looking to have her on in a few weeks and there you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's the point of it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Making lots of connections. I love it. I've definitely got more open. Yeah. I, I think that's, I've learned from people like you and about being more approachable to people. Like I've always, wanted and I, I remember Harriet said this about I was we walk past homeless people like I love to just sit down and just find out you know what what's the reasoning or why you know because there's so many interesting people in in life that are probably just sat on your doorstep Mm -hmm. it's just about sitting down and having and you might have bad conversations but they're not all going to be amazing are they and then you you you've if you have 10 bad conversations one good one then it's worth it isn't it you know yeah i used to i used to do that a lot i'd go and buy a mcgriddle or something for mcdonald's and just go give it to a, a homeless person and just have a conversation i think a lot of the times people people are looking to be seen as humans yeah it's it's um um, like we said about loneliness, it's interesting. I mean, loneliness is probably one of the biggest killers, isn't it? You know, people people just want to, have, like you said, be treated as a human, don't they? Mm -hmm. You know, and and um, just have, and like you said, a little part of your day you could take out might make their whole week. Mm -hmm. Like you said, you could have a five-minute conversation with someone. That could make their whole month even, you know. That can so turn their life around. You, you read a... Kind of as as you've said, you read Matthew eleven thirty six, and it ch it changes the way you look at the world, changes the way you look at life. You can't you can't unlearn things once you've seen them and you you've learned them and incorporated them. It it can have a far broader impact than anyone gives things credit for. Mm, yeah, yeah. And so until you do stuff like this, you re you sit back and realize I'm very bad at reflecting. And so until you sit back and definitely finish in university, you're like right. Wow, a lot's happened over that <laughs> four years. Because mm -hmm. you're up in it, you just never get time to sit back and and think about stuff, do you? So I've been trying to journal more as well. Yeah. What do you journal about? Just daily stuff. Yeah. Like my uh I, I speak to my granddad probably every day, every other day. We faced he's he's eighty eight, but he's um yeah, uh, eighty-seven. Sorry, he's got FaceTime now. Nineteen thirty-two. Oh, he's eighty-eight. Yeah, so he's got 
FaceTime now. And oh, well, he's had it for a few years, but we FaceTime all the time. And he was like, Harry, if I could go back, I'd journal every, he said, conversations I have with people, just anything, you know, and just take time to, to sit back. And um, he said, it might be pointless, it might be a meanness of conversation, but you might find that journal in 40 years and be like, oh yeah, I had, I had this conversation with Josh today on, you know, what's it, the 20, Six. 26th of April, 2021. Mm -hmm. It might be 2061. You might be like, wow. Yeah, I remember that now. So, um, yeah, just random. You know, I've got my journal here. You probably read through stuff. It probably doesn't even make sense. And it's very bad handwriting. It just, because I hate proofreading my stuff. And that's the worst thing. I've got a full journal here, but I've rarely read through it. I, I, I never read through my journals. I, anytime oh, no? I, there are some times where I'll go back and read them. A lot of it's theory and philosophy and so occasionally I'll go through and reread it. It's actually everything. I put everything into my journal. I normally journal once or twice a day, depending on, it really helps to get thoughts out of my head. I, uh, yeah. I tend to experience intrusive thoughts a lot. And so okay. I'll just write about those and then they, then they leave. Oh, well, I've never tried mm. that. Yeah, that helps. I found it helps. I also, any, anytime I'm thinking about something super heavily, if I just sit down and, write about it for 20 minutes it normally dissipates a little bit and I do I try to write a after I finish each book I write what I would put as an introduction for that book if I were to okay. actually write the introduction for that book I try to write that and kind of synthesize the the thesis and the points that they make and kind of the impact that it had on me so I think yeah. those are all valuable ways to understand this is my journal a little fella here uh, I got this is the this is the finished one and then oh nice oh that's an old wolf pack oh i literally harry i have that same journal oh really yeah 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 randy gave it to me this is another one of my finished journals yeah right here oh this one <laughs> yeah that's funny yeah i mean yeah that's interesting and now i've got bits of paper that i've i've put in here that you've just like uh you scribble down so you didn't have your journal with you yeah but i mean one like you said there has to be enough content in there one day in a few years i'll probably look for it mm -hmm. like, wow what did i put there i i think that often when i reread my old journals what an idiot oh massively yeah yeah um and obviously when i'm really famous everyone else they, they can just the authors can just take that from my autobiography, you know. I was going to say, just uh, <laughs> just sign me over a few of your journals and I'll write something for you. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. But, no. Nope. So, yeah. Always learn stuff talking to you. Yeah, me too. Do you want to, let's, let's conclude here and then we'll have a little off the books for a few yeah. seconds. Yeah. Okay. So, thanks for listening to anyone who made it this far. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks, thanks for having me on, Josh, as well. I had a great yeah, thank time. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. No problem. Always a pleasure, never a chore. <laughs> exactly.